Hello everybody, my name is Fiona McPherson and I'll be hosting today's event. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Open University to today's webinar session. On today's session we have Janet Barker from the Open University in the background providing support. We have our presenter Richard Wingfield and also Jane Barrett from the Career Farm who's going to be hosting the Q&A session today. Before we start, I'd just like you to familiarize yourself with WebEx if you haven't used it before. I know many of you attend these sessions, um, but if you're new to it, um, we'll just quickly go through the screen so you can familiarize yourself with the tools that we have. As you can see on the main part of the screen, this is where we will share any content such as presentations and videos and uh, internet browsers. Today we've just got a presentation, um, so that's what you can see on the main screen at the moment. I'm just going to, there you go, and you can see what we look like so we're not completely virtual. Um, at the top of your screen you'll see you've got an audio broadcast box and this is where you can adjust the volume up and down or if you need to mute it for any particular reason that's where you'll actually do that. On the right hand side of your screen there are two tabs. Uh, there is the participant tab and the Q&A tab and you'll be using these during the webinar session. So we're just going to have a quick practice. There's also a chat tab, um, which some of you will have found, and that's got the uh, speech icon on. Please don't use this for sending through your questions for the presenter, um, because we don't monitor that. You need to use the Q&A tab, which is the tab that has the question mark on. So we will have a practice just using that. OK, so first of all, if you can select the participant panel, if you've not already done so, then go down to the bottom and first of all just click on the show hand icon. Great. So Richard might ask for a show of hands on a particular subject and that's where you would actually do that. That's great, you've all found that. Okay. Then the next icon I want you to click on is the tick icon and this is the feedback button and you have various options on there. Um, so just have a quick practice. Um, I just want you to answer the following question with either a yes or a no, so that's a tick or a cross. Have you attended a webinar before? Okay, so a few of you, or quite a few of you have actually, which is great. There's three or four of you that haven't, okay. So that's good, so at least you're familiar, familiar with the, the format. Okay, now we're going to move on to the Q&A panel. So as I said, it's the panel that has the, or it's the tab that has the question mark on. So if you want to click on that, to send a question, all you need to do is if you select panelist from the ask drop down menu, type in your question and then click on send and we will answer as many as we can. Now today we will be having a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. However, if you do have a question that's um, particular to a point that Richard's actually discussing at a particular time, if you want to send that through um, and then Jane will actually um, put that to Richard if it's pertinent to that point. Otherwise what we'll do is leave it to the end um, and Rich will go through them then. So for quick practice, if you just select panelist from the ask menu and then just type whereabouts you are geographically today and click on send. Okay, gosh, we've got people all over the place today. Let's have a look. We've got Celine in London, Mark in Surrey, Dave in Derby, Puneet in Vienna. Uh, we've got Aideen in Dublin, quite a few of you are actually here, we normally have quite a lot of people abroad actually as well, Rich in Frankfurt, brilliant. So that's how you actually use the Q&A panel, um, so please don't obviously use the chat one as I discussed before because we won't be monitoring that so we don't want to miss your questions. Okay, so now I'm going to hand you over to Jane Barrett who's going to introduce Richard for you um, and we look forward to receiving your questions as they come through. Good afternoon everyone. Um, 
I first came across Richard when I was exploring um, uses of Myers-Briggs, so MBTI, um, to use with entrepreneurs. And I, I came across Wealth Dynamics, and I came across their website, and I was really interested in it. Um, and I found Richard through this site and subscribed to his newsletter and kind of got to know the type of work that he did within organizations and how he used Wealth Dynamics. And I thought this would be really useful because it's a very useful tool um, for people who are entrepreneurs thinking about being an entrepreneur or growing, growing a company. But it's also really useful for building an effective team within a company. Um, and Richard's trained in Wealth Dynamics, um, and, and it's really helped my development. So um, I thought it would be great to ask Richard um, to deliver this webinar. So I'm delighted you're, you're leading the webinar today, um, Richard, and sharing your knowledge of using this tool within organizations um, and how we might use that in our own working life. Um, so just a little bit about you. Um, following a distinguished career in transportation, uh, Richard founded the, the Breffy Group, where you're um, he's principal consultant. Um, he's an international corporate facilitator, and he helps directors and boards become more effective by bringing structure and clarity to their thinking. Um, Richard's run um, and designed management development and team building workshops um, all over the world, um, from the UK, Canada, India, Middle East, South and West Africa, um, and all over Europe. Um, Richard has a master's degree in management, is a master practitioner of both NLP and Wealth Dynamics. Um, and for the last six years, um, Richard's represented businesses, uh, Birmingham's business and professional services community as board director of Birmingham Forward. Um, and he's also a member of the board of governors of the International Association of Coaching. Um, Richard, you're, you're a real expert in, in the coaching world, um, and I'm delighted that you're running this webinar. Um, as I said, I've subscribed to your newsletter, I think now for a year or so, and it's called Corporate Coach. Um, you've edited that for the last 10 years, which is no mean feat. Um, and I understand you have about over 20,000 readers, um, so that's, that's fantastic. Um, and I understand yesterday that um, two of your books have been um, launched on Amazon um, around corporate coaching. Um, so Richard, um, I'm going to hand over to you um, to start the webinar. So thank you for um, leading the webinar today. I'm really looking forward to you sharing your insights. OK, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Yes, I'm Richard Winfield. And because of the power of Wealth Dynamics, uh, you will understand why I am what I am uh, and why I do what I do a little bit later in the day. Uh, just a little clarification, uh, in terms of my two directorships that were uh, mentioned, uh, those have recently come to an end, uh, which is great relief because the, every other meeting of the International Association of Coaching was at 3 in the morning, so I get better sleep now. But uh, it does uh, reflect the fact that I have taken a great deal of interest in coaching and um, <clears throat> in the description, it says, I help bring structure and clarity to people's thinking. Uh, I'd also, uh, it, it helps me analyze good systems and how systems work. And again, you'll understand later why I do that and how I do that because of the power of uh, Wealth Dynamics. Uh, just one other thing, uh, Wealth Dynamics was originally developed for the entrepreneurial part of the world, and it is active in the UK under a different name called Talent Dynamics uh, in the corporate world. They are exactly the same. It's just the language has changed slightly for marketing purposes. So shall we start? Let's get on. Uh, where are we now? So the point about is it's very nice of you to come and listen to me, and it's nice for me to have a chance to talk to people on a virtual basis, but what's the point? So why do we use profiling systems? Well, you can use profiling systems at different levels of sophistication, but the, the first reason, which is uh, probably fairly obvious, is to understand how we as individuals operate. And it might well be used, for instance, by HR people when recruiting, um, and it might well be used by coaches when understanding people, and it might well be used by therapists in helping you understand yourself. So learning how an individual operates is the basis of what it's for, but to my mind, it's not actually the most useful thing, because it <coughs> the reason there are two reasons why I like using it. Uh, any form of profiling, and the first one is just to get over the very simple fact that other people are different. 
you don't need to understand all the sophistication of how they're different initially. But if you continue to assume that everybody thinks the same as you do, has the same assumptions and aspirations as you do, and is likely to respond in the same way to things as you do, you will rapidly find life very frustrating. So by understanding that different people have different profiles, then immediately I think you should become more sensitive and sympathetic in the way you respond to others. Plus, of course, if you can actually understand and learn to understand how other people operate, then again, you can work better with them. So we, if we understand how we operate, and we understand a little bit about how others operate, then we can learn how to communicate more effectively, and also, as we'll see later, how to delegate roles and work more effectively. But the other, the other reason that uh, I like um, using profiles is in terms of how teams can be built. Uh, it's very useful to work with members of a team to help them to work better. Uh, but sometimes it's worth looking at as a team as a whole and noticing that maybe there's a gap in the team or there's a big bias in a certain direction. And it may well be worth taking uh, corrective action in terms of changing members of the team as well as how teams operate. So there are lots of ways we can use profiling in order to become more effective. And surely that's a key part of being successful in business. So the main question, though, is who are you? So it might be worth you thinking a little bit while we're on this program, uh, just who are you yourself? And maybe whether you learn anything. Because sometimes we might be two people. We might be the person we've been brought up to be because of expectations and things we've been told and learned and positions we've been put in. And hopefully those are entirely congruent with who we actually are, but not necessarily so. And so one of the uses of these profiling systems is to identify the real you and then to learn how to live your life as you rather than as somebody that other people thought you ought to be. So let's just look at a few of the systems that you may have heard of or may have come across. I think probably the most famous and the most well-established one is Myers-Briggs Type Indicator. It's highly thought of by the professionals, and it's talked about by the HR people as a favored uh, system, and it's, it's most impressed, uh, impressive for, um, for psychiatrists, psychologists, and so on. They claim it's very accurate. I think actually very often it's more important actually whether something is useful and effective just rather than whether it's effective, whether it's accurate. However, the question is, uh, why don't I like it so much? Well, one reason is it's expensive and you need qualifications to use it. But this is the reason that I don't really like MBTI. I think you're either an MBTI person or you're not. And this is the reason. You may be an ISTJ, an ISFP, you may be an ENFP, but what does anybody else know about what that means? And how does it really help people to understand how they relate to each other? So it's very sophisticated, but I don't think it's user-friendly. This is uh, another system um, based on a different approach. And this is more user-friendly to my mind because it has got the beginnings of a means of communicating with people. And if an organization uses this repeatedly, then you will find that within the organization, people start to adapt and adopt the various languages and say about when I'm red and you're green and such like. And it has the second advantage that um, as, people are, as people use it, um, then you get a team built up, then they are actually plotted out uh, in different positions on the screen. So you get an element of a picture. Um, so it's user friendly, it's memorable because you can visually plot, and it does introduce a language. But again, I think you've got to be in it to understand it. Uh, this system, the DISC system, is based on the same psychology uh, and research as the colors system. And this I prefer, and again, when you know a little bit more about me, you'll understand why. Um, it is a very simple system. It's not copyrighted so that it's, it can be used uh, very cheaply, or you can buy systems on the internet and so on. But it is sufficiently accurate, in my experience, to be very useful. 
and it has got various benefits to be how it can be used. The DISC stands for Dominance, Influence, Steadiness, and Compliance. So all you really need to learn when learning to use it is what those four words mean, and they're very closely uh, related to the normal English language. The other thing that you need to learn is that uh, it balances your motivations, and some are above a line and some are below the line, and all you need to know is that. So it's very simple to use. It has structure. And because of the way it works, which I shall show you in the moment, the structure is easy to adopt in terms of team building. So let's look at some examples. Uh, this is the sort of printout you will get. <coughs> so you can see it's very visual, and it basically just gives you four positions for the four motivators. And in this case, the two that are above the line are dominance and influence, and dominance is the higher one. When we look at the next one, You'll see in this case, uh, influence is the highest, and it's the only one above the line. Now, what that means is that these two people can relate to each other fairly easily because they share the influence. Now, let's now look at this one. This one now has a benefit because it's got strengths above the line in steadiness and compliance. So this is very complementary to the other two. But unfortunately, you will see it's not compatible with the other two because they don't share anything above the line. And in this last one, you'll see <coughs> that, that there's another person who can relate. So we've got, two, we've got two influences. Those can talk to each other. And we've got, sorry, we've got two steadinesses. They can talk to each other. In this case, we've got two influences. They can talk to each other. So you can immediately see that this is a, a team where they've got a range of, of strengths, but there are two groups that won't talk to each other very effectively. So I think it's a useful system. Wealth Dynamics, I think, is much richer than the DISC system, and we'll explain to you in a moment why it is. So firstly, it has structure. And from my point of view, structure is very important. And uh, I'll explain to you how the structure works in a moment. Secondly, it's user-friendly. It uses language which is closely related uh, to what people are used to using in their normal day-to-day -day life. And it also has a rich selection of, of, of people uh, uh, to demonstrate what the various uh, uh, profiles are. So it's very easy to use or very easy to understand. Uh, the language is simple. It's got a s small number of words which are easily understood by people who speak normal in English. And it can be used for team building. And for me, team building is a really key part of the use for any of these profiles. Now, this is similar to the other profiles. It applies to people. That's what it's all about. However, the great strength about uh, Wealth Dynamics is it can also be applied to organizations and it can be applied to markets. So it has a progressive life, um, which uh, is similar in the way that you look at the people, organizations, and markets. So it has three levels, really, uh, of power, which the others, I think, lack. So let's just stop for a moment and have a little bit of feedback from you people. So um, if, if you have some experience of MBTI, um, let's have some good score. Now, um, Fiona, are you running this or am I running this? Uh, no, no, it's OK. I'm just about to launch, but all the questions will come up at once if people want right, to Right, OK. Go so basically, if you have experience of MBTI, you have experience of insights, you have experience of DISC, or you have experience of wealth dynamics, let us know. And especially if you've completed a Wealth Dynamics profile, that's an online profile, uh, then we'd really like to know that as well, just to give some background. OK, they're coming through thick and fast. And, and Richard, is Wealth Dynamics what you use most in your practice? I always used DISC because I really like DISC. Since I've used Wealth Dynamics, I don't think I've used DISC at all. So yes, it is what I use. 
And also, it's something that we use in terms of language as well. So when we talk to each other, we say, what's your profile? Um, and mm. if somebody tells us what it is, then the rest of us in the group understand. So it's a community thing as well as something that I use. Right. Okay, we've just got one person who's just finishing off, and then I will launch the results so you can see. Okay. So hopefully you should be able to see those coming up. Oh no, it's, it's just about to come up. Do you see those, Richard? Have they come up yet on your screen? Yes. So MBTI is quite uh, strong, and in fact it's the only one that's strong. Uh, which implies to me that most of the people on the call are probably from corporate or government type organizations. I don't know whether that's likely, because that's where it tends to be used. Mm -hmm. I think it's very popular in corporate. Yeah. yeah. So shall we move on? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Wealth Dynamics was developed by Roger Hamilton. <coughs> Roger Hamilton has a Chinese mother and an English father. Um, and that's relevant to the future of what we talk about. But basically, what he wanted to do, like other people have done, is he wanted to find out what makes successful people successful. And he was looking for the strategy that he could apply. And as other people have found when they've uh, investigated these sorts of things, there is no such thing. <laughs> but he was able to identify eight strategies, and those are sufficient. So. What he's managed to do, and uh, we will tell you at the end about the book he's written, which explains this in a lot of detail, is to identify specific people who represent these eight strategies, and we'll go through those later. Um, but eight strategies are sufficient to explain. Um, he, through his Chinese mother, has uh, taken a great deal of interest in the I Ching, which is a th several thousand year old uh, Chinese document. And we'll come back to that in a moment, but I'll just mention in advance the I Ching is the same basis as is used by Myers-Briggs. So yeah, here we are, 5,000 years old. The I Ching um, is the basis for Carl Jung's work. It was translated into German, I think, at the beginning of the last century. Carl Jung came across it when it was available in German and has developed his theories. And people like Myers-Briggs have developed their profiling system based upon Carl Jung's work. So the I Ching is the same core for MBTI and Wealth Dynamics. The I Ching talks a great deal about the natural cycle in terms of the seasons. Um, and they talk about the energies of the different seasons. I don't know whether anybody's looked at the I Ching. I thought I would read it to back up what I know about Wealth Dynamics. It is very confusing and complicated. Uh, but if you study it, apparently there's all this richness in it. But they do relate to the, to the energy frequencies and the seasons of the year. And you'll see later how those tie together the individuals, the organizations, and the markets. So <coughs> just as I was saying, we work through the different seasons, spring, summer, autumn, winter. And we tend to go around in cycles. So wealth dynamics are based upon four energies which uh, relate to the Chinese background. The dynamo energy is the dynamic, creative, let's get started, let's do new things type of energy. And that relates to the spring in terms of the Chinese energies. And you'll see here it's shown in green. The blaze energy is the warm, sunny, uh, let's all be friendly, let's get together, the relationship and gregarious type of energy. And then the tempo energy, which you can't see quite so well at the bottom in the autumn, uh, is to do with timing and noticing what's going on. It's being aware of what's going on around you. And then the steel energy on the left is the more cold, hard, analytical uh, energy. Um, and in traditional terms, uh, the steel energy in the I Ching was to do with the emperor, I think it was, who was responsible for getting the harvest in. And if you think about a harvest and you think about the weather, particularly in the UK, 
uh, you have to be very well organized and very efficient uh, to get it in between the rains and so on. So people who are steel-like are very keen on detail and getting things correct. So let's look at them in a little bit more detail. So the dynamo energy is related to spring, and it's worth knowing about the spring as much as anything because it helps with the, the, the language of it. Uh, dynamo people are very intuitive and very creative, and they're, they make their money really through innovation. The blaze people, the people on the right, the summer energy, are warm and friendly and so on. So they are extroverts. They like to be together in groups. And they make their money uh, by making things bigger. And we'll come back to that in a little bit to the time. The tempo energy, the autumn energy, is much more sensory. It's about being aware of what's going on and what's the right time for something. And they make their money generally uh, by uh, responding to messages. And uh, traders in particular will come across buying and selling at the right moment. And finally, the steel energy, the winter energy, is introvert, inward looking. They're the people uh, who live in their caves with their spreadsheets and so on. And they make their money by multiplying. So whereas the blaze people want things to be nice and big, you may have one big thing. Uh, steel like to multiply them. So for instance, if you think about um, uh, a CD, uh, there's only one CD, but you can print it out a million times, and it doesn't require you to be involved in anything. So you're multiplying your power uh, rather than making it bigger. So if you do uh, a profile, and uh, clearly I would recommend this, uh, this is what you will get. You'll get a visual picture which shows you the layout of the energies and then superimposes a profile for you. And in this case, you will, you will be told that it is a dynamo energy and that you are a creator because that's the largest part. And traditionally, uh, in interpreting them, people have respond, uh, focused very much on the visual. I actually prefer to look at the top of the page where we'll see the frequencies. <coughs> so in this case, you'll see uh, that the dynamo is the biggest at 36%. And then blaze and steel at 24% are the same, and tempo is 16%. And most of you will notice that that adds up to 100%. So everybody is equal, comes to 100%. It's a matter of distribution. So in this case, the significant things really are the dynamic energy, which is powerful, and the tempo energy, which is rather less powerful, and the other two are in balance. So let's just uh, see now how we can interpret those energies into uh, the profiles. The first profile we'll see is that of creator at the top, which is purely a dynamic energy. They're always starting things, they're inventing things, they're coming up with new ideas. Lots of energy, fun to be around uh, for a while. And then if you go two rounds to the side, you'll come across the supporter. The supporter is the relationship person <coughs> <coughs> the person who tends to have groups of people around them, they tend also to be very good uh, team managers and so on. They're people people. Now, one of the benefits of a supporter is that the supporter will take the ideas of the creator and say, those are fantastic, you're a really good chap, but there are ten here. I think we could probably manage with one or two. Let's just focus on number one and number three. So they do some sorting and they bring some sense to it all. Now, if you combine the dynamic energy um, with the blaze energy uh, on the top right-hand corner, you'll see the star. And the star is the person who can be very creative in a presentational system. So the stars are the people who like to get out and uh, be among people, but not among people like a supporter within a team, among people in terms of being on the stage. So they make good salespeople. They are very good at promoting and they don't need to have anything of their own to promote. So if a creator creates, then the star is somebody who can actually promote what they've created. If we go around to the bottom now, to the trader, you see that they are people who are relating very much to timing. And we hear a lot about the City of London, for good or for ill, uh, but buying and selling, knowing the time, noticing what's going on. 
trader type people are also quite good at people like receptionists because they have a sense of what's happening in an organization. They've got tabs on things. But if you combine now the blaze energy with the timing and the trader energy, the tempo energy, you get the deal maker. So the deal maker, like the supporter, has got lots of friends. The deal maker is the classic person, I don't know whether anybody has them these days, but metaphorically, who has a little black book or a Rolleiflex. Uh, they've got lots of contacts. And then they also have the tempo things about knowing what's going on and what's the right moment. So a deal maker is the person who will notice and find the deal, bring the people together, and then the skill that they have is to simplify and explain. So supporters might well be confused by lots of stuff, um, and supporters might not be able to talk so well to the traders. The deal maker is the person who can interpret. So they, bring, they find the deal, they bring people together, and they manage the negotiation. Let's go down to the left now, to the Lord. The Lord is the person who is cold, analytical, and probably antisocial. And they are particularly good, as I mentioned earlier in terms of our emperor, of really getting things very, very efficient and squeezing out waste. And Lord, in our terms, would be related, for instance, to landlord, somebody who owns property and makes their money out of the rent. And clearly to do that, they've got to make sure that the properties are well maintained and that there's no waste, that they've got good, good contracts with the gas board and such like. And the interesting thing about a lord is that they can make their money out of somebody else's product. So, for instance, if you have an oil refinery or a steelworks, you don't need to own the oil or own the steel. What you own is the process. Right. So combining, therefore, the, the Lord's cold analytic energy and the trader's sensitivity, you get the accumulator. And the accumulator is somebody who notices what's going on, like the trader, but rather than buying lots of things instantly, will wait their time. And they will do lots of analysis using their Lord-type skills. And when the time is right, they will do a big deal. And they will buy well and they will probably hold on. So Warren Buffett is very famous now because of doing exactly that. He's a classic accumulator. He does lots of analysis, and he waits, and he waits, and then he jumps. And lo and behold, a few years later, he's got 20% growth or whatever it is. So that's the accumulator. Accumulator also could be a very good project manager because they have a sense of timing, they make sure things are done on time, and they have a sense of analysis, so they make sure things are done well and efficiently. Finally, if we combine the Lord type personality with the creator type personality, you get the mechanic. And the mechanic is somebody who is always looking for new ideas in order to improve. So the mechanic is the person who will create and refine your system. And when they've refined it, they will refine it and refine it unless you stop them. So they're always improving, but they think in systems. So the things to know about them, just like any other profiling, is that people are different. The thing about this is that Wealth Dynamics will actually tell you how to find the people you ought to work with. So we'll come on in a moment about how to find the people that you need to work with to make a good team. You can also use it to decide who would be the best people to be mentoring you, and also what sort of wealth network to build. Because clearly, lots of people say what you need to do in life is go out and go to lots of networking meetings. Well, that's great if you're on the right-hand side of the graph. But if you're on the left-hand side like me and not particularly gregarious, it can actually be a waste of time. So knowing your profile can teach you what's the best way to build a network. And also, you make your money in a different way, you look after your money in a different way. So knowing who you are can make you more effective. However, the important thing, and the message applies to all profiles anyway, is anybody can be a great leader. What you need to do to be a great leader is to have the right team with you, and also to be doing the right job at the right time and uh, in different markets and different times, different people might come to the, to the head in terms of the leading. So just let's 
let's look at a couple of profiles. Now, this is my profile, and this is why I'm what I am. I'm a mechanic. I'm a classic mechanic. And when I first saw it, I thought all people's profiles were a version of this, because it is very clear, isn't it? It's a simple arrowhead pointing to mechanic. If we look at the wealth uh, energies at the top, you will see, uh, bearing in mind that they add up to 100, 44% of my energy is dynamo energy, that's creative. And 44% of my energy is Lord Steel energy, which is analytical. So I am very much an analytical systems thinking creator. If you look at Blaze, the energy over the right, to do with relating to people, it's almost non-existent at 4%. So I am not good at going out, building teams, and finding new people to work with. If you look at tempo, that's also pretty small at eight, so it's not my strength. So it's very important for you, if you want to work with me, and for me, if I want to live my life, to understand where my strengths are and where my weaknesses are. So that's a very simple, classic profile. But what about this one? This is my son, and clearly, this is not a well-differentiated profile. It actually says at the top that he's a trader. And if you look across, you'll see his scores are 24, 24, 24, and 28. Tempo is four more than the others. So they say that he's a trader. But actually, if you look at it, and if you look at the energies, really, he's a fairly general purpose person. He's not specifically anything. And so he has a big benefit over people like me because he can relate to any part of the process and he can relate to any sort of person. So he's probably quite good at uh, managing a team. Not necessarily a great supporter, but his Blaze score is 24%, so it's not bad. But he can talk to me and he can talk to the trader type people and he can talk to the creators and, the, and uh, others. So it's a fairly general purpose sort of um, profile. Just in summary, if you look at the top and the bottom, that's the, bot the, the first line, innovation and timing. Innovation at the top, timing at the bottom. The innovators make their money by creating new things. The timing people, the people at the bottom, make their money by noticing what's going on and acting accordingly. If we now look left and right, the people on the left, as I've mentioned before, they make their money by multiplying. They do it by being very efficient and saying, how can this operate without me? How can I create a system so that it will make money without me? So they multiply, just as I mentioned with the CD. Uh, one CD can be multiplied a million times. Whereas the people on the right, they want to be involved with lots of people. It's a lot, without them being egocentric, it's about me. So how can this be done only with me? How can my team be involved? So we want big things to do. Um, a few times, rather than a little time, little things, many times. So this is the key to success and one of the things that differentiates wealth dynamics. Let me just explain about wealth. Wealth can be money, obviously, but wealth actually means well-being. It's an old, it's used in its old English term, which means well-being. So your well-being, your success, your effectiveness is a function of your value and your leverage. And value is what you have, and leverage is what somebody else has. So if we take me as an example again, I believe that my value is very high. Um, I have a lot of experience. I've been doing what I do for 20 years. I've traveled the world listening to some of the world's thought leaders. I'm an avid reader of books, and I devour The Economist every week. I have got a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience, and I believe, a lot of wisdom. But my leverage is virtually nothing. Because in order to exploit what I've got, I need to find teams and I need to find stars who will promote me. And therefore, my wealth is actually quite low, even though the potential is high. So if I can find the right people to work with who will leverage my value, then my wealth will be great. Now, the quid pro, quid pro quo of that is somebody on the right-hand side who's good at running teams to, uh, to get things into action 
or somebody on the right who's good at doing deals, or somebody on the right who's good at selling and promoting, they can't actually promote nothing. They need something to promote. So somebody like me who can create products and create systems is very valuable to them. So their value is in their relationships, and their leverage is in my products and systems. So do you see how it works? So Wealth Dynamics shows you how to find the people of greatest support, people who can leverage your value and whose value you can leverage. Now, ideally, if we're talking about a team, we should have either all eight profiles or a very good balance of all eight of all four energies. And there is a there is a model here that uh, we can do it with three people if we absolutely necessary. So if you think about the eight um, profiles going round. Um, if you move three to the right, three clockwise or anti-clockwise, that's the first person who would be useful to work with. And then you can move a further two and the second person. And that will give you a fairly competent team. So if you think about me being top left, I'm a mechanic. One to the right is a star, two to the right is a supporter, three to the right is a deal maker. So sorry, one to the right is creator, uh, two to the right is start, three to the right is support. I've got, I've got the right answer now. So it's very useful for me to find a supporter to work with. Then a further two, deal maker, trader. So supporter and trader and Richard Winfield, the mechanic, would make a really good team. So I know what to look for. Unfortunately, <laughs> I need a supporter to find those people. Uh, but it gives you a very simple method of working out not only who you are, but who you need and how to find them. So there we are, mechanic, Richard, I, one, I, two, I, three. I think that's really useful in also thinking about when you're putting a new team together, perhaps within a, a company where you would start. Is that correct? Absolutely, yes. Because yeah. if, if you're thinking of a board of directors, you might have eight or ten people. You would expect to get a good mix. But sometimes mm. teams have only got two or three people in them. So this yeah. gives you a simple way of working out how to get the mix. Mm -hmm. And the great thing is that means you've got the complementarity and the compatibility. Because one without the other, you're no use. If you can't talk to each other, it doesn't matter how complementary your skills are. And even worse, <laughs> if you love talking to each other, the likelihood is that you won't have a full range of skills. <laughs> okay? Yeah, thank you. That's useful. Jolly good. So we'll go through some examples now, and this is one of the joys of R Roger Hamilton's work, is that not only has he given us the theory and the analysis and also the process for knowing what to do with it, but he also has picked out a range of examples so that you can really get some experience of what they're like by looking at the flesh. So a creator, these are the people at the top, they're task-based and their language is to ask what? They want to know what they can do. And they're visionary, and they're able to inspire others, uh, but they can be over-optimistic and easily distracted, and also people can get overwhelmed with them with all their new ideas. And we've got three classic examples here. Richard Branson, whom we know very well, always creating something new. Walt Disney, clearly a creator. And Bill Gates, who created one of the best, biggest systems in the world. And we'll come back to Bill Gates. The star profile, the one on the right, they ask what and who. They're task people and they're, peop they're, and they're people people. They ask what and who. They're vibrant, energizing, quick to deliver, but they can be overbearing and controversial. So uh, stars are very important to us, but they can get out of hand. And here are some here. Oprah Winfrey. Now, remember Oprah Winfrey is very successful, very, very successful, but nearly all her success is actually through other people. She, she promotes other people on her show. She doesn't do dancing or music or whatever. It's, she, she promotes other people. And Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, very successful at uh, promoting. Richard, just to flag up, it is actually quarter to two. So right. just to, to okay, no, yep, <laughs> just let you know, carry on I'm sure a lot of people are on their lunch breaks. <laughs> right, good for them. <laughs> Jolly good. Well, I just go through then. The, the supporters ask who, and 
uh, they enjoy team building, networking, making lots of relationships, and so on. And Jack Welch, who's now retired, but was very famous for his, in GE, his main job was just building the business teams, people. And Steve Ballmer is the person who makes Microsoft work, as opposed to um, Bill Gates, who created it. So you see how the teams work together. The man with the hair, deal makers, they ask who and when. They know the people. They put them together. Very outgoing, approachable. Uh, they like to please, which is not necessarily a good thing. And Donald Trump and Rupert Murdoch. And like him or love him, Rupert Murdoch has built the most amazing business by putting things together. The trader, when? And these two people, George Soros, I think, was the man who bet the Bank of England, and John Templeton uh, is probably less well-known, but he's set up a famous trust fund, I think. But they make a lot of money by dealing in the moment. The famous uh, um, Warren Buffett, who waits, does his research, he asks how and when and gets it right, he buys low, he hangs on, he makes a lot of money. And Paul Allen, who was the co-founder uh, of Microsoft and is now an investor. Um, the Lord, the people who ask how and make it effective, efficient, and screw things right down. And we've got Lakshmi Mittal, who, of course, is the biggest steel processing owner in the world, and Gordon Brown. And you see, these are people very controlling and cautious, little patience, and no social niceties. So there's Gordon Brown explained, I think. The mechanic, we ask how and what, and we are perfectionists and we will go on improving and improving and improving until we're stopped. But we're not so great on our personal relationships. Michael Dell, who's in the news at now, and Jeff Bezos, who is probably the ultimate in, in building systems, I think, at present, isn't he? So, if you're a creator, we use you to build a better product. We don't use you uh, to sit in the back office. If you're a star, we send you out to build the brand. We put you on brand research and so on. If you're a supporter, we give you the team. If you're a deal maker, uh, then you're there to bring people together. You shouldn't be too accountable, just allowed to get on with it because you'll deliver. Trader, watching the time. Accumulator, uh, building things for the long term. Lord, screwing things down to be efficient and, and getting the money out. And finally, mechanics, building a better system. So that's all about the people and I will go very far through the enterprise things now but bearing in mind that we all work in systems so we've worked out what the people should do but it, as you build your a new product or a new business then you need these people at different stages and it works in the same order you have to have a product you have to have a brand then you have to have some people to look after it then you need to do some deals joint ventures and so on then you might be selling shares and so on and, uh, until effectively you're licensing the system or selling a franchise. So we have some time for some questions and for people then to get back to their lunch. <laughs> Richard, just while we're waiting for questions, so if you'd like to type in a question, then please do that, that now. Um, I've got a question. In terms of finding a mentor, because um, work I do within organizations, often that's you know, people are looking for mentors to help them make the next step up. Um, what profile would you suggest someone different to you so that you can learn a, from a different profile? Or, or, or what would you suggest in terms of choosing a mentor? It depends what you want, doesn't it? <laughs> and right, do you yeah. have to have only one mentor? So yeah. let's, let us assume that you are in a business startup situation then somebody who has started a business in the past and has been a, is a creator would probably be very helpful for you because he, you would share a need with his experience. But as, mm -hmm. you're, as you develop through your career, perhaps, and your more general purpose, if you get too much feedback from someone who's the same as you, you will get your prejudices, prejudices reinforced. So I think probably what I would suggest is you would then want probably to go the three and the two onwards to get people who are different from you. But right. as ever, it's horses for courses. But the key thing, I think, about Wealth Dynamics is that it does have this time value to it. So what, what you need will vary according to the stage that your career or the business is in, uh, or even the economy. So, mm -hmm. for example, I would say our economy is at the end of winter, I hope. 
and mm -hmm. I would think from today the European economy is at the beginning of spring. So the strategies that organizations should have been using over the last few years and over the next few years will be different and they will relate to these seasons. We've, we've started to get a couple of questions. Go One on. um, is, does somebody's profile change over time? I don't think so. And I think one of the things about profiling is to endeavor to use it to find out who you really are. Because people do change over time, but they tend to change as a result of external influences. And they would be much more effective and much less stressed if they could keep themselves actually influenced by their internal self rather than external pressures. And one of the mm -hmm. things it enables you to do is to choose your career path to make sure that it reinforces who you really are rather than trying to push you into somebody else's uh, profile. Mm -hmm. um, where can we find the Wealth Dynamics tool to practice and use for ourselves? Right. <laughs> well, I think probably the next slide. But at the end of this, you'll find yeah. two things. There is a link. There we are. There's there a link go. to a website, uh, which is mine, knowyourprofile.com. That gives you a great deal more information than I've given you so far. And at the end of it, or combined with it, is the opportunity to buy a profile. The profiles are done online, and I think you'll find they cost £100 each. And then yeah. the book, Your Life, Your Legacy, um, explains the research and uh, the conclusions in a lot of detail. Unfortunately, it's not available on Amazon, although there are seven I think there are eight copies available today second-hand, but uh, you'd have to get that through Roger Hamilton's uh, organization. But uh, those are the two things that can take it further. And certainly the Know Your Profile, I can assure you, is free and has quite a lot of information on it. I think that answers the, the next question, which was where do I go to get an easy online profile of my team? So, yeah, you're, and I can, your, your website has a lot of information. I think you can use it as a discussion tool. You can obviously either take, get your team to, to do the profile, um, or you can use it as a discussion tool as well, which is useful. Yes, um, and I've got and another. I think it is, it is yeah. important to notice not just to take the profile as it's such, because as we explained in my son's case, the word is not very descriptive of the reality. So do look at the shape of the graph, and in particular, look at those four scores. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got another question. Um, profiling is all very well in the private sector, but what of the public sector, where recruiting is very stringent and little consideration is given to fit? I'm not <laughs> well, all I can <laughs> say is, is more fool them. <laughs> because, but the point is that I don't think that's necessarily true because I think MBTI is very strong in the public sector. Um, it's mm. just uh, that uh, this is another way of doing it. And you, if, if you're doing team building work or strategy work and so on after all the recruitment, if you're doing something that's nothing to do with HR, then you won't necessarily have access to the MBTI. And this is a much more customer friendly type of thing. Uh, but I would be very surprised if there's no profiling in the public sector. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, from what I've seen, it sometimes is used for recruitment, but it's more a, a, a tool for team building and understanding yeah. your team members and how you can work more effectively. Yes. <laughs> Actually, uh, the, the, the participant has said, try the civil service. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> well, my wife is in the civil service, and I just ah. hear the stories I hear. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so just going back to saying that, yeah, I think with MBTI and, and, and Wealth Dynamics, it's often a tool used for, you know, for, you could use it yourself within your team to think about, okay, um, yes, yes I, I did a process with a team in the States a few years ago where we did three or even four different profiles. And as we put mm -hmm. them up on the wall, it became fairly obvious. I said, look, there's a big hole here, isn't there? So it doesn't, you don't need to use only one. Yeah, yeah. Could you, could you tell us about a time you, you've used the pro Wealth Dynamics within a team, within a company, and, and how that was useful? Yes, well, I'd like to tell you about a tiny company, actually, because I think it's, it's, it's fascinating, and there's a lesson to it, which maybe people in bigger organizations might not be able to face up to. This was a husband and wife working together, and it was a classic business in which the husband went out and got the business and so on, and the wife stayed at home and did the administration and the accounts. But when they did the profiles, they found that the husband was a lord, 
so he didn't really like meeting people and he was very pernickety about detail and the wife was a star so she was a bit frustrated with all this detail and she loved to meet people so they swapped jobs completely and their business took off and also their, mm -hmm. their marriage improved but I think the key for people in bigger teams is to think well okay this isn't just how we can relate to people to each other better it's actually how we can change roles and there are various yeah. examples I've come across where they have changed the way the team operates, reshared out the role, reallocated the roles, and that's been mm. very effective. So you need mm. to be prepared to bite the bullet, I think. Mm -hmm. And are there any common mistakes people make with wealth, profi the wealth profiling tools? That well, we yeah, the, 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 the one I think is to, to treat it too, simplistic, too, too simplistically and just take the name. So if you're, a, mm -hmm. if you're a star or if you're a trader or something, that's not all of it. And that's why I say go back to those four energy schools and really look at how you operate. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and have you come across people who have thought they're something else, but actually when they do the profile there, they come out as, some, you know, as, as their profile is different from what they thought they were? Yes. And one of the things you have with common? all of these, it's the same. You have to discipline people, say, to give them the mindset in which to answer the questions, uh, because sometimes people will will skew it in order to fit with what they think they ought to be. So you've got to answer the questions honestly, uh, without trying to beat the system, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But people okay. do get some surprises. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, right. I think if that's pretty much all the questions we've, we've had, uh, Richard, so um, thank you very much. Are there any final comments you, you want to make? Well, as I say, it is out and about as wealth dynamics, but it's also out and about as talent dynamics. So if you come across either, they are the same. Um, and the talent dynamics is more directed to a corporate world. It's only the way that it's interpreted, uh, but uh, I would recommend that people take notice of it. Uh, I think you'll find, certainly my experience of it over the last three years, is that talent dynamics in particular is, is growing quite fast. Um, there's a major conference on it next month in, in Manchester. I reckon you, in two or three years it will be one of the major um, systems in the UK, uh, probably. So don't mm. get confused by the two terminologies because they are the same. Okay. We've just had one quick question just before uh, we finish. Do you think we should challenge um, people's roles so that they can improve their weaknesses and what they're not good at? Uh, <laughs> are you trying? Mm. Are you saying should we train people to do what's then what's outside their natural talent? Mm. Mm. Uh, that's so often done, and I don't. We well, find out what someone's good at and help them to get better at it. Um, if 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 they are illiterate or something, they might need to be taught reading and writing. But in most cases, <laughs> yeah. once you've got the basics, when you're going for talent, focus on your talent capacity, not trying to do uh, what the job says. There's so much stress very... by people being trying to be good at something they're not good at. I have spent years trying to be good at networking, and it's a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, yeah, that's interesting, and I think that's backed up by research, Gallup research by um, Marcus Buckingham in yeah. Strength, his book Strength Finder, Absolutely. which is very much Absolutely. about you know play to your strengths. Um, yeah, manage around your weaknesses. If you you know you, you may have to um, address some of those, but really it's a case of um, accelerating your your strengths or magnifying your strengths and Absolutely. finding the right team members, which is obviously what you've yeah. been talking about today. I, I think the only reason we get it wrong is because people think back to school when the purpose of the school was to get you to be good at everything because it was giving you basic skills. But we're not talking about mm. basic skills in business. We should be talking above that. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Richard. I'm just going to hand over to um, Fiona. I found that really interesting to go through um, and understand a little bit more about wealth dynamics. So thank you today well, for leading the session. Well, it was a rush. Session. And say, if you want to read it more slowly, there's a lot more information on Grow Your Profile, Know Your Profile. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lovely. I'd just like to obviously thank Jane and Richard for a great session today, and I hope that everybody got something out of that. Um, obviously, a copy of the slides will be available um, via Janet, so if you're interested in those,
we can go through them later on, that you can do the so. Um, just to let you know, we've got a couple of webinars coming up. The first one on the 11th of September is being presented by Anthony Greenfield on the five forces of change. And then the next session is on Wednesday, the 2nd of October, uh, being presented by Carol Pemberton, which is on career resilience. Both these sessions are evening sessions from 6 till 7. So if you're interested in attending those, obviously get in touch with Janet. So I'd just like to thank everybody for attending, and we hope to see you.